How are you, Peter? Hey, Rich. I'm doing well. Thanks a lot. You bet. So what do you think is the storyline of Super Bowl 52? Uh, man, I, you know, I listened to all of yours. Okay. And uh, I, I, I really think, you know, this is just my opinion, uh, that, you know, Brady has done so much. Uh, it, it would be hard for me, it, no matter what happens in this game, to not think he's the best quarterback of all time. I mean, I, I, I had, you know, in for much of my NFL coverage career, much of my, you know, time covering the NFL, having done a lot of research in the '90s to write a book about pro football history, um, I kind of had a soft spot for Otto Graham. Um, who in the 10 years he played, played in the championship game of his league all 10 years, won seven titles, and also won four passing championships. So it would be hard for anybody to beat that, but I think that Brady has beaten it. The longevity uh, is, uh, you know, unheard of. Uh, The fact that um, he basically has been at or near the top of his game um, in his 17th year as a starting quarterback in the NFL, um, and the fact that uh, he's going to win the MVP most likely uh, in his 17th year as a starting quarterback. I can't imagine if he loses 51-3 to in this game why I still wouldn't think he's the best quarterback of all time. So, I, and, and I think, Rich, this, this game and this season really cements the legacy of Belichick and Brady is the best quarterback coach combination without any question. And add Bob Kraft to that, um, it, it, you know, is the best combination in NFL history. We, we've always sort of thought of, or at least I have, um, Eddie DeBartolo, Bill Walsh, Joe Montana as the gold standard of owner coach quarterback uh, trio. Uh, but, Rich, they lasted 10 years together. Um, Kraft, Belichick, and Brady have lasted 18 years, 17 years with Brady starting. So it's it's one of the most incredible stories I think any of us will ever see, not just in football but in sports. That said, though, Peter, um, everyone that I talk to says that there will be a meeting once this game is over, win or lose, amongst Brady, Belichick, and Kraft to hash something out. What What do you think that hashing out actually is and how do you think that's going to manifest itself once Um, it's done well i think what we know right now is that you know bob Kraft is going to own the patriots in 2018 um what we also know is that barring the surprise of the century tom brady is going to play quarterback for the patriots in 2018 we all assume that bill belichick is going to coach the patriots in 2018 uh, I can't imagine that he would be opening the door as wide as he is for uh, uh, for Matt Patricia, Josh McDaniels, uh, and perhaps, I mean, he certainly allowed Brian Flores, who's going to be his defensive coordinator now that Arizona has, has filled its coaching uh, vacancy with Steve Wilkes. But, you know, I just, it's hard for me to imagine that Belichick would simply walk away after having sort of emptied the cupboard. So I still think they'll all be back together. And what they'll talk about, uh, Rich, I mean, look, I've, I've had this discussion uh, quite a few times with people inside the Patriots since the West Seth Wickersham story came out, um, which the Patriots have vocally and largely denied um, in which I just say, well, okay, let's let's just see. Time will tell. Um, my feeling is that Seth is obviously a reliable reporter, uh, and in my opinion, there's something to this. What exactly it is, I'll be honest with you, I just don't know. Mm. I've asked, I've looked around, I've put out the old sniffers, uh, <laughs> and I don't know the answer to it. But I do think that, and, and again, this is not unnatural. You tell me, where has an owner, a coach, and a quarterback worked together ever, together in football in such an emotional, draining game 
as football at the highest level of football. When have you worked together for 18 years and, and everybody walks out in, in kumbaya spirit? There's got to be some issues between, you know, the three most powerful people in the organization. So we'll find out what they are, but it certainly hasn't stopped them from accomplishing the greatness that they have. And I'm sure, again, this is going to be brought up media day, et cetera, et cetera, uh, throughout the week, and it'll be moving on to Philadelphia. Peter King here on the Rich Eisen Show. What what intrigues you about the Philadelphia story, Peter? Um, I think the fact that, Rich, if you watch uh, the – uh, the Oakland game on Christmas night, Oakland, Philadelphia, and then the Dallas game the next week when when Philadelphia's first unit was in there for most of the first half. And then you watch the Atlanta playoff game. I'll tell you what I saw in all that. And I saw a team that was protecting the quarterback, that was making sure that the quarterback didn't throw the ball away, take too many chances, et cetera. And I think this team had a protective cloak over Nick Foles. And then I think this past Sunday, as Chris Long said to me after the game, hey, you know, with Nick Foles right now, the preseason's over. In other words, he hadn't played football, in essence, you know, for four months. And then all of a sudden he's thrown into the fire. It's five degrees outside. And, you know, it's probably a pretty tough deal for him. But, but having said all that, at this point, as we think about it, right at this point, you know, we saw a different game plan with Philadelphia on Sunday. Nick Foles threw the ball downfield, and he threw it downfield effectively. And so right now, the New England Patriots, when Matt Patricia looks at this tape, he's going to say, okay, and he's going to tell Devin McCourty and everybody in the secondary, he's going to tell everybody, we got to defend the whole field now. This is not a dink and dunk passing game anymore. And that's going to make it harder for the Patriots. So I think the fact my most interesting story on the Eagles is that now they're not a team that is going to shy away from letting Nick Foles try to win the game. Yeah, they're not going to take a knee uh, with two timeouts and 55 seconds left in the first half. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) And, you know, again, so what's the one thing you think that Belichick's going to and Patricia's going to try and take away the quintessential? That's what they do. Yeah, that's what they do. What do you think? I don't really think. There is one. There isn't. I mean, normally I would have said, um, you know, because you saw that what they did with Leonard Fournette is that they really jammed up the box and tried to make uh, tried to make Bortles beat him. And in part, we can sit here and say, see, Bortles couldn't beat him, but did he really have much of a chance to beat him? And I will always maintain that the throw he made to D.D. D. Westbrook, that Stephon Gilmore made the biggest play that he will ever make in his NFL career, in his football career, in his life as an athlete, uh, one of the great plays ever on the top level of football. Um, that, 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 was, that was a very good throw, but it wasn't a great throw. And I think that that throw showed me, a crucial, crucial throw, showed me that if I'm Doug Marone, I'm thinking I should have put the ball in Bortles' hands more in the fourth quarter to try to keep the ball away from the Patriots. That's what the Jaguars should regret about this game. Well, to me, that Gilmore play was certainly when we're, we've been spending the, the whole week prior to the game talking about Coughlin's image, Coughlin's presence, and also Coughlin's secret sauce uh, in games against the Patriots. That, that would have been the Tyree or Manningham moment of the game for Jacksonville and Gilmore swatted it away. That would have been it right there, Peter. I agree, Rich, and I, in my opinion, I think that's a really, really good comparison because, you know, that game right there, or that play right there, if he misses that ball, there's a very good chance that D.D. Westbrook catches it. And even if he somehow uh, comes short of scoring a touchdown, you know, the Jaguars, you know, are in position at that point to even run a little bit of clock away and and score and be in very good position to score and leave the Patriots nothing left. So I'm not saying the game would have been over if he could, if Gilmore doesn't make that play, but it would have been darn close. Last minute I have for you, Peter, is give me the name of somebody who's missed at the Pro Football Hall of Fame last couple of years, last long time of years that you're hearing this year might have the groundswell to finally get in. 
prior to oh, going to Minnesota. I'm always wrong about it, Rich. But <laughs> it's okay. I am. I'm always wrong. Sometimes all you're are. closest to a story you don't really know. But I walked out of there last year, and on Sunday morning at the hotel in Houston, I ran into Tony Baselli. I was going down to the Starbucks to get a coffee and do some work on Sunday morning before going over to the game. And there was Baselli, who had the same idea as me. He was getting coffee, and I said to him, Tony, I'm just going to tell you this. Yesterday was an extremely encouraging day for you and I also believe for John Lynch but but probably more for Baselli in this way okay so Baselli played at the absolute top level of football for six seasons and a little bit more than that but the absolute highest level shut out Derek Thomas shut out some of the great pass rushers of his day and he has not gotten in the hall because many people have said well his career wasn't long enough well, he was at least as good and maybe probably better for six years than Terrell Davis was for four, even though Davis was, was unbelievable for three of those years and extremely good for a fourth. But now that Terrell Davis has made the Hall of Fame, uh, you know, to me, that opens the door wide for Tony Baselli. Peter, uh, love our chats. Look forward to seeing you out in Minnesota. Sounds great. Thank you. You bet. That's Peter King. At SI underscore Peter King. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.